Well, welcome back to the Louisiana Delta Community College uh, filming studio here. Uh, we are uh, summer 2020, business 101 introduction to business online with Professor Joe Lane. And we are getting ready to get into chapter one. Uh, I thought of something as I was putting this up on the board to, uh, to get us started for chapter one. I am not known as one of the foremost spellers in America. Uh, I, I really wish that I had this whiteboard like this, and I wish there was a button that I could push, and it would correct any misspelling that I had. But so far, I don't think, I don't think they've invented that yet. They probably have, and I just don't know it. But, uh, but if I misspell something, it, it's, it's okay. Uh, I, I'll try not to misspell it so badly you don't understand what I'm, I'm putting up here, but I'll try to do a pretty good job with the spelling. But if I forget to get an I before E or after C or some of that sort of thing, or I put in an extra this, that, or the other, uh, just, just bear with me. I think we'll be able to, probably be able to, uh, to figure it out. The title of Chapter 1 is Our Dynamic Business Environment, and that's exactly what we talked about in the introductory video. Uh, now, if, if you're watching this video and you haven't watched the introductory video, uh, stop this one, go back and watch the introductory video so you can understand what we're doing here and the terminology that I'm using and everything and why I'm using it. Uh, we also talked about in uh, the introductory video, we talked about different businesses and we named some businesses. We talked about how incredibly important business is to America. Uh, and this coronavirus where many, many businesses, not all, just think, all the essential businesses stayed open. What if all of them had closed too? The tremendous change it would have made in America if every business would have shut, closed down, and went away. As I mentioned to you in the introductory video, it would move us back 200 years in time. Our whole standard of living and the way we live would change drastically. It's already changed a good bit, but hopefully we'll get uh, We'll get back to uh, uh, something, even though it may be something of a new normal, something of a normal. Now let me, again, let me mention, uh, from a business point of view, do I think business in America, the economy of America will come back? The answer is yes. It's not going to be overnight. It's going to take some time. Some areas of our business world, community, are going to come back faster than others. The airline industry is going to be slower. The travel and tourism industry is going to be slower, and that's going to be harmful to Louisiana because travel and tourism is a big part of Louisiana. The cruise ship, cruise liner industry is going to be slower. But we had, before the coronavirus, we had an incredibly strong business environment, we had an incredibly strong economy, you know, and I think we're going to be able to weather this, it's just going to take some time for all aspects of business to come back. Others again will come back faster. All right, so let's get into chapter one. Let's start learning some business stuff so that uh, we're smarter than 85% of the people in, um, in America. And, and I don't mean that in a derogatory manner. We're, uh, maybe I shouldn't say smarter, but we understand the world of business more. And if, if business is going to be your career or some aspect of business is going to be your career, as we talked about in the introductory video, um, it's good for us to start learning. Now here's, here's how I'm going to kind of do chapter one. A lot of times the way you can learn business is by learning terms or by learning words. Chapter one is full of words, new business words. Now some of them you've heard, most of them you've heard, probably not as clear understanding as we're gonna have when we get through, uh, we get through today uh, with, uh, with this particular chapter one. So here's what I've done, I've done a couple of things. I put a bunch of words that we need to know or be familiar with in a box here. So we're going to go through here and we're going to understand these words. Then also, I put a customer over here. And there's something about a customer we need to understand. And then I put business 
And I put it business and I put a lot of, of words around business and we need to kind of understand what that is. And then lastly, I put businesses create in a blank. And I said, they do this with the factors of production. And we want to make sure that we know what the factors of production are. So I've kind of diagrammed for us chapter one. And I think I can tell you, you know, we talked about knows and be familiar with. I think I can tell you that everything in this box is going to be a be familiar with, except for business, and business is going to be a no. Now, if you've watched the introductory video, you know what that means. If you haven't, watch the introductory video. And then anything else that's either a no or a be familiar with, as we go through chapter one, uh, we'll, I'll identify that for you. All right, let's officially get started. I put a customer over here on this side. Something that is important for us to understand is that in 2020, the customer rules. What does that mean? You've got to please the customer in 2020. You say, well, that's always been the case. Really, it hasn't. There have been times, and we'll talk about this in some chapters, when the customer didn't rule, the product ruled, or other things ruled. But in 2020, the customer rules. They don't have to uh, shop with you. They don't have to frequent your place of business. They can go other places. If you don't satisfy the customer in 2020, you're going to go belly up. So just keep that in mind as an overarching idea as we go through chapters one, two, three, four, all the way through this text. Remember, as we're talking about everything, the ultimate boss, the ultimate boss is the customer. You don't please the customer, you're not going to survive in business. And by the way, <coughs> most businesses <coughs> that open are going to fail. Do you know that? Statistically speaking, more than 50% of the businesses that open after five years are gone. You know the number one reason? They don't understand the business side of business. Somebody opens up a, a restaurant or a cafe. They're wonderful cooks and wonderful chefs. And they're really like people. So they say, hey, this is going to work great. I'm a wonderful cook. I'm a wonderful chef. I really like people. I'm going to do great but they don't know the business side of business. A lot of times it's not the product that you have or the service that you have. Most times, that's not what makes you go belly up if you do. It's the business part. So this is really, really important stuff. All right, so let's start, let's start over here. We've already, well, we, we, I guess we have started here, so I'm gonna put a check mark. We understand that in 2020, the, the customer rules. All right, let me start over here in this box. Let me take the word business out of this box. Most important word in the whole text. This is something you've got to know. You've got to know the definition of business. You've got to know what business is. We've identified some businesses. We've talked about businesses. But what is a business? What does a business do? Now, I hope that some of you are saying they make stuff. They produce stuff. They sell stuff, and I'd say that's right. But then I'd ask you, they produce stuff or they sell stuff, why? Well, well what do you mean why? why? Why are they doing this? What's the purpose of producing stuff or selling stuff? Well, to be able to stay in the business. Oh, okay, well, I understand that, but what does that take? And somebody's going to say, <coughs> because they want to make a profit. Ah, that's pretty good. So let's do that. A business is any entity that seeks to provide to others 
goods and our services for a profit. That's what a business is. Any entity that seeks to provide goods and services uh, and or services to others for a profit. <clears throat> so we got it. Did I say that was going to be a no on the test? Did I say that's probably going to be a definition on the test? Mm, yeah, yeah, you just about believe, believe that. All right, so now that we, we know the definition of business, <coughs> excuse me, any entity that seeks to provide goods and services to others uh, for a profit. So let's look at some words that I used here and make sure we understand those words. So we, we, we've got business out. Goods and our services. Okay, let's take let's take the word goods. Let me strike the word goods out of here. Do I have that up here somewhere? Yeah, goods. Let's learn that word. What are goods? Name me some goods. I'm fooling with my glasses here. Are those goods? Is that a good? Vehicle goods? How many goods are there that businesses produce? There's a term I like to use, not a term, a word, gazillions. Lots and lots and lots and lots of goods. So businesses produce goods. And now we know what goods are. That wasn't very hard. <coughs> but like I said, I want you to be familiar with all these words that's in this box. Except for business, I want you to know that. So we've got the word goods. Let's take the word services. Well, services must be different from goods, or they wouldn't have a different name. So can you name me some services? Tax service. How about a car wash? How about custodial services? In the very near future, I'm gonna get my hair cut. Barbara's. Hairstylist. <clears throat> Services. Now let me see. Goods seem to be things we can touch, feel, wear. This is goods. My shoes are goods. So goods, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can wear it, you can eat it, you can do things with it like that. It's tangible. Goods are tangible things. This chair that I sit in and hope calls me up. That's a good. Services are not tangible. They're, they're more of an intangible sort of thing. If I go to the dentist and get a filling, is he providing a good or a service? Well, he's putting in this little filling, yeah. But basically, he's providing or she's providing me a service. A restaurant. If you go to a restaurant, are they a part of a goods or services? Well, there are services, but wait a minute, I get a sandwich. Well, what do you do with it? You eat it. The idea is that you don't take that good with you and say, I'll keep this sandwich with me forever and ever. You eat it. Or if you don't eat it, you throw it away. So, restaurants are part of a service industry. Now, if you go to a grocery store and buy groceries, those are goods. Because you're taking those home and you're going to use those. Those are tangible. All right. So now we have a pretty good idea of what, what goods and services are. Now some things may be kind of in a, you know, some things may be what well, is part of a service, is part of a good, so is it a good or a service? And the, the business industry, they make that distinction. Like I say, restaurants are a good example. You actually do get something, but the thing that you get is for consumption. So the restaurant industry, fast food industry is considered a service type industry. Do you think in the United States businesses produce more goods or more services as a whole? If you said goods, you used to be right. You're not anymore, but you used to be. Used to, our businesses produced more goods than they produced services. In 2020 and for the last number of years, our businesses in America produce service, more services than they do goods. We are what's called a service economy. 
Do we still produce tons and tons and tons of goods? Yes, but we produce significantly more services. All right, so we've got goods and we've got services. There are services, let me scratch that out. We've got that word done. For a profit. Now profit is a word, profit is a word that is pretty well misunderstood. What is profit? Well, profit's the money that I get for running my business. No, it's not. No, it's not. Profit's a, well, if profit is when, that's when I got left over. Well, profit's pretty important stuff. Profit's not left over stuff. You don't think a profit is left over. Hey, I do something and you know, here's what I got left over. That's not the way it works. But we're gonna have to learn a couple of other words, I think, to learn the word profit. All right, let me grab a word here. Let me grab the word revenue. And let me put the word revenue right here. Can you give me a one word definition of revenue? If I said you gotta tell me what revenue is in one word, could you do it? If you said money, that's right. <clears throat> now, I'd probably ask you, <coughs> Businesses receive money from doing what? Selling goods and or services. So revenue is money received for selling your goods and services. Let's take another word and get it out of here. Uh, if I put it in here. Hmm. Yeah, expenses. What are expenses? Can you name me some for a business? The building note, if they own the building, a rental expense, the spence, expenses for the, the inventory they have in the business, what's well, probably the largest expense a business has? Labor expense for their people, uh, advertising expense, insurance expense, lights, utility expenses. Do businesses have a lot of expenses? have a lot of expenses. So expenses, and we've named some, is the cost of doing business. Revenue is the money received from selling goods and services. Expenses are the cost of doing business, the things we talked about. Okay, what if you subtract your expenses from your revenue? What do you have? Ta-da! Profit. One of the things that people don't understand. Profit's the money you get from owning a business. No, you, no, that's not, that's not right. That's revenue. Well, what is profit? Well, profit is revenue minus expenses. So do you understand now we're using these words, but now we understand what profit is. Is profit really, really, really important? Yes. Okay, looking at this right here, just look at this right here. What can you do with your business what can you do to increase your profit? Think about it. You don't have to, you don't have to have a book. You don't have anything. All you have to do is look at this right here. And you can tell me three ways that you can increase profit. Got one yet? Okay, let's do it. What if you increase revenue? If you increase revenue, your expenses stay the same, or your expenses stay less. If you increase revenue, does that increase profit? Yep. Kind of get it now. Number two, what if you cut expenses? Revenue stays the same, but expenses are cut. Does that increase profit? Yep. Or some combination of the two. That's the third one. The way to a business increases profit is to increase revenue, reduce expenses, or some combination. Anything you tell me would fall within that. So now we kind of understand, oh, by the way, if expenses are greater than revenue, what do you got? You got a loss. So let's go over here and let's scratch profit out. Let's scratch loss out. 
let's see what else we want to do uh, next. Let's knock out a couple of words, standard of living and quality of life. I think I put that on your, on your study guide. In fact, you have the, have the little box here on your study guide. Chapter study guide. The standard of living is defined as the amount of goods and services available for purchase. In the United States, do we have a high standard of living? Or in other words, do we have a lot of goods and services that we can purchase? The answer is yes. We have a very, other nations have a high standard of living. We certainly have, if not the highest, and it's the highest standard of living, is uh, you know, we, uh, the United States. Uh, it's the amount of goods and services available for purchase. Quality of life is the general well-being of a society. Now, let's get outside of the coronavirus right now. Okay, let's just go back to normal times. What was the quality of life in America as compared to most anywhere else in the world? Well, if you've been most anywhere else in the world, you'll know the quality of life here is incredibly good. Our quality of life is wonderful. Do businesses contribute to our quality of life? Yes. Again, forgetting coronavirus, I know you can't do that. If businesses went away, would your standard of living and quality of life suffer? Yeah. It suffered greatly. So businesses contribute to our standard of living by providing us a tremendous amount of goods and services that we can purchase. And businesses contribute to our quality of life, the general well-being of society. Now, is our society perfect? No. Is there always room for improvement? Sure. But is our quality of life pretty darn good? The answer to that is, Yes. All right, what else have we got in here? Uh, let's do, oh, I tell you, let's do an easy one. What is e-commerce? E-commerce. Yeah. Buying and selling of goods and services on the internet, by the way of the internet. E-commerce growing. Wow, has it grown a lot here lately? You know, I think this coronavirus where we've had these stay-at-home orders and things, I know I have ordered several, several, several things by way of the internet here in the last, the last month. I think that this is gonna help move us more and more towards kind of a different style of marketing, the way we buy and sell products. E-commerce has continued to grow, Amazon, you know, places like this. But I think e-commerce is going to probably take a spike and move up even more quickly. Buying and selling on the internet, it's here to stay and it's going to get more bigger. Okay, that's e-commerce. Hey, what is an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is someone who, and you probably already said this, who owns and normally operates their own business. We talked a little bit about being an entrepreneur when we were talking about businesses and failing and that sort of thing. If you would like to be an entrepreneur, raise your hand. Ah, probably a number of your hands went up, figuratively speaking anyway. A lot of people want to own and operate their own business. They want to be their own boss. They want to make their own profit. That's the American way. That's kind of like the American dream along with owning your own home. Okay. So entrepreneurs are folks that want to own and normally operate their own business. And as I've said before, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you've got to be business smart. You've got to be business smart. Do entrepreneurs take risk? Let's take the word risk out of here. Yep. What do entrepreneurs risk? If, if you're saying things out loud, thank you, that means you're really involved. Uh, if you're not saying things out loud, but you're thinking them, that's, that's good too. But most of the things we can come down to do is this. They're risking their time and they're risking their money. They're putting money into something that they want to try to make happen. And they're risking their time because in, in, in working with that business, they're taking that, you know, time is, is money. 
and they're taking that time which they could be using doing something else to, 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 get, to get income. So businesses risk, entrepreneurs risk time and money. Okay, gosh. We've only got a few more left in here. Let me do a non-profit for you. Let's talk about a non-profit business. Okay, I'll do that definition really easy and quickly for you. A non-profit business is a business that's too stupid to make a profit. Well, wait a minute, I don't think that's right. Can you name some non-profit businesses for me? If you have said the, the, the city or town where you live, that's a nonprofit. The city of Monroe, city of West Monroe, the town of Sterlington, those are nonprofits. Louisiana Delta Community College, nonprofit? Nonprofit. Hey, you gave me some money. I know. It's a nonprofit. United Way, Salvation Army, American Red Cross. I go to North Monroe Baptist Church. Uh, been a member of North Monroe Baptist Church a long while. My wife is a church pianist there, very involved in the music program. Um, I have uh, I've served on the, the finance committee a number of times, just, just came off of a three-year term there, and I, I teach a Bible, one of several that teaches a Bible study class there. So we're very involved in North Monroe Baptist Church. Uh, is that a nonprofit? Yep. Well, wait a minute. Do they take in money? Yep. Do they spend money? Yep. Does, does the United Way take in money? Yep. How does the United Way get most of their money? Just like churches, donations. Do they spend money? Yep. Delta Community College. How do they get their money? Some money from the state, some money from you, some money from grants. All right, so let's understand what a nonprofit is. Something else that, that people have trouble with. Let's go back here to, first of all, what we said a, just a, a regular, for-profit, regular business is. Any entity that seeks to provide to others goods and services for a profit. All right, we understand that. A profit for whom? A profit for whom? Well, the people that are working in a business, no. Normally, no. Who gets the profit of a business? The owners. The owners. So now let me clarify. If you are an entrepreneur and you're, a, you're the only one, it's just you that's in the business, you're working in that business, that's true, and that business makes a profit, you're getting the profit, but you're getting that profit, you, uh, you are an owner. Let's take a business like, uh, let's take a business like CenturyLink. Uh, CenturyLink uh, has a lot of folks out there at that big building on 165 that are employees of CenturyLink. Are the employees of CenturyLink getting that profit? No. The employees of CenturyLink are getting a salary. The owners of CenturyLink, those people that hold stock in CenturyLink, they're the ones that are sharing in the profit. So remember this. Profit goes to the owners, the ones that own the business. If you go to a bank, do banks have owners? Yes. There's people that own that bank. They get the profit. Now, let's say that you've got somebody who's the, the president of a business. Is he going to get the profit? No, he's going to get a salary or she's going to get a salary. Let's say that person also owns stock in that business. Could that person also receive some of the profit? Yes, but as a stockholder, an owner, not as an employee. Does that make sense? It's really important for you to understand any entity that seeks to provide goods and services to others for a profit. A profit for whom? A profit for owners. Does the United Way have owners? No. United Way has a board of directors that helps oversee it. Does the city of West Monroe have owners? No. They have board of aldermen that are elected to help oversee it. Does the Salvation Army have owners? No. Does Delta Community College have owners? You see the idea? 
it's not owners. What happens is nonprofits what a nonprofit does, they do not make a profit. They have what's called a fund balance. A fund balance is what's left over. Whew, I used the wrong term. The fund balance is what you have after you subtract expenses from revenue. And what do you do with that fund balance? You use that fund balance for whatever the purpose or the cause or the mission is for that nonprofit. United Way collects a lot of revenue, primarily from donations. They have expenses. Uh, Janet Shedd, she's the CEO. Uh, I am very, very, very involved with the Chenault Aviation and Military Museum. I love the museum. Help with a big fundraiser for that museum almost every year. We will be, do be doing a big fundraiser uh, this weekend, the run for the red, white, and blue if it wasn't for the coronavirus. But uh, the Chenault Aviation and Military Museum, it's a nonprofit. It doesn't have owners, it has a board of directors. But uh, Nell Calloway, the granddaughter of General Claire Chenault, she's the CEO. Does she get a salary? Yes, she does. You know, but remember, she's, she's, a, she's an employee. But Chenault Aviation and Military Museum, does it have a particular mission? Yes. North Mill Baptist Church, a particular mission? Yes. Salvation Army, a particular purpose, a particular cause? Yes. All right, so, we say, so what are we saying? We're saying that for nonprofits, the fund balance, that amount that, is, that it remains after expenses are, are subtracted from revenue, they go not to the owners, but they go to accomplish whatever the purpose or cause or mission is of that organization. United Way, I, worked, I was on the United Way board for a number of years, and not now, haven't been for a while. Rays of Sunshine, worked with that group for a long while. Rays of Sunshine helped women that had dependency issues. And, and they had, you know, housing for them, all kinds of things. The money that Rays of Sunshine raised was to take care of those folks. The money the Salvation Army raises is to take care of the homeless, take care of, you know, you know that's the role of the Salvation Army. The food bank. All right, so I'm beating this to death. But that's, that's the difference. A business is any entity that seeks to provide goods and services to others for a profit, a profit that goes to the owners. Is that good? Sure. That's why, that's why people are willing to risk time and money so that they can be profitable as an owner. But there are some businesses that are nonprofit. They don't, they're not after a, a, a profit for the owners. They're after raising money for a cause or a purpose or a mission. Now, here's the question. Should a nonprofit be run in a business-like manner? Absolutely. Should you try to maximize your revenue as a nonprofit? Sure. Should you try to keep your expenses low? Sure. Why? Because the fund balance that you have, the larger your fund balance, the better you can accomplish your purpose, your, purpose, your cause, or your mission. Uh, I am very patriotic in nature. That's probably one of the reasons why uh, Chenault is so important to me. And I work hard with a fundraiser for, for Chenault. Uh, I was in the military. I'm a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I support several veterans organizations. But I'm really careful with the veterans organizations that I support. I always check to see how much revenue do they raise, what are their expenses, and how much of that fund balance is going to do the things that they said that needs to be done. It's important that the majority of those funds go for the purpose, the cause, or the mission. All right. Uh, I get off on tangents occasionally. The, this was one of them. Let me see, do I need to raise anything? I don't think so. Uh, so that takes care of non-profit. We've only got a couple more things in here. Stakeholders and outsourcing. All right. Let's do outsourcing. 
you know what this is? I'm going to go behind the camera. I'm going to make sure you can see that. Hang on. Yep, okay. It's in your vision. I, I'm a pretty renowned artist. I'll be giving you a lot of artwork as we go through these different chapters. Uh, and so uh, this is the uh, beginning of training you in uh, abstract art. Well, most of you already know, obviously, this is the United States of America. This is the USA. Because you've already seen Florida down there, and right here is Louisiana. All right. I'm going to leave that up here. So if you know that, you know what this is? Now you're catching on. That's Mexico. And Canada. I'll be glad to share my artwork with you. We'll get back to that in just a minute because we want to talk about something here called outsourcing. Most people don't understand about outsourcing. Is outsourcing good or is outsourcing bad? I don't know. Depends on who you talk to. Remember we talked about balance? So let's talk about what outsourcing is. What, is, what does it mean when a company outsources something? Outsource. Sounds to me like what it means is when instead of a company doing something itself, they give it to somebody else to do. Okay? Why would they do that? Maybe because they don't have the time to do it. They don't have the expertise to do it. Or somebody else can do it cheaper than they can. And if they can do it cheaper than they can, that reduces their expenses. Example. I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur. I've opened up a business and I have about 20 employees. We're doing well. Uh, I got my degree at Delta Community College uh, in business and technology and I'm being real successful in running my business. However, I have 20 employees and the employees have to be paid. And you've got to pay them, you know, every two weeks and I've got to take out uh, taxes and file a, a, a 941, I think it's called. And I got to make sure that uh, you know all that's done right, and and if, you know, and if I'm going to have any kind of retire, I, yeah, wait a minute, all that stuff's too complicated for me. I don't want to do payroll for my people. Can I hire another company to do payroll for my company? Sure can. There are companies out there that their their business is to do payroll for other companies and do it right. I'm going to outsource my payroll. If you go to a bank. And most of you probably have been in a bank, credit union. And you know, usually there's two or three or four offices in that branch, and then you know, maybe the largest office there's somebody, that's the branch manager. I mean, you know what a bank looks like. Have you ever seen the branch manager out mow in the yard? Probably not. You think they could mow the yard if they had a lawnmower? They probably could. Are they paying the branch manager to mow the grass? Uh -uh. The branch manager can be doing things more, uh, what's, my, what's my word, important, I guess I'll say, to the bank. They need to be making loans, running the, the, the bank branch, doing the things they need to be doing. So who does the mowing? A lawn company. They outsource it. Why do they outsource it? Because they can be better, same thing, do you ever see the tellers in there cleaning the commodes and cleaning out the restroom? No. Are they too good to do that? No, that's not the reason. It's because they're supposed to be doing teller stuff, banker relationship stuff. That's the idea. So if, you, if there's something you don't know how to do, if there's something you don't have time to do, or something that somebody else can do cheaper in your business than you, outsource it. Is that good? Huge yeah. Because it, it helps you be successful in your business and it helps another business be successful. It's a win-win. So why are some people so against outsourcing? Well, what instead of outsourcing something to the local custodial service or outsourcing something to the local company that does payroll, what if you outsource something to out to Mexico City? Hmm. Let's take a company 
here in Louisiana, it's the ABC Furniture Manufacturing Company. What do they do? They manufacture furniture. And then what they do, they have some big old warehouses and they manufacture their, their furniture. They put that manufactured furniture in the warehouse and then they sell that furniture all over the United States and actually they have sales all over the world. And they produce that, but they produce that. Since I drew the line here, I'm gonna make it Shreveport. It looks like they're right in Shreveport. And they've got, they manufacture that furniture there. They have their warehouses there. Uh, their executive offices there. Uh, and that's their business. But you know what they've been looking at? We could move our manufacturing to Mexico City. And we can have all of our manufacturing done in Mexico City. What probably is a lot cheaper in Mexico City than it is in Shreveport, Louisiana? Salaries, employee wages. So we could, here's, here's what we're gonna do. We have a thousand people in manufacturing here in Shreveport. We have 250 people that's in the warehouse. Because we have lots of warehouses, big warehouses, you know, because we ship all over the world. And we've got 50 people that we'll call administrative people, CEO administrative people. We've got 1,300 employees. So here's what we're going to do. We have determined that we can move our manufacturing to Mexico City. We're going to ask and we have found 50 of these people that do manufacturing here, 50 are really good employees, they will transfer to Mexico City to make sure that the manufacturing's done well, oversee it, make sure we still have good quality. And we're gonna have to hire about 1,200 people in Mexico City because they just don't have the skills yet that we have, we have here in, uh, in Shreveport. But when we hire these, we'll have 1,250 people down here as opposed to a thousand, but we can cut our manufacturing costs by 27%, 27% lower. Is that good? That's huge. Manufacturing cost is probably really, really a big cost. It's a big expense of our company. If we can reduce it by 27%, what's that gonna do to our profits? It's gonna move our profits up. So that's pretty important stuff. So we're gonna eliminate this. We'll keep our warehouses here. We keep our administrative offices here. And we'll now have 300 people here in Shreveport. Is outsourcing good or bad? Hmm, kind of depends. Depends on who you ask. If you ask the company, the CEO, Huge, yeah, it's great. We've got 1,250, 13, 14, 1,550 employees, 1,250 of them which are in Mexico. We're increasing our profits, making our owners happy. It's fantastic. What if you ask the 950 people that lost their job? What do you think about outsourcing? What do you think they'd say? Don't like it. They'd probably say more than that. What about the city of Shreveport? They just had, they just had uh, 1,300 employees. Now they've got 300. There's a, there's a thousand employees that are gone from Shreveport. 950 that are unemployed and 50 others that went to Mexico City. What do you think Shreveport thinks about it? They probably don't like it. So is outsourcing good? Yes. Is outsourcing, well, let's do it this way. If you do outsourcing regionally to other parts of the United States or, or especially to other parts of your, your county or your parish or your city, is outsourcing good? The answer is yeah. It helps you, it helps them, it helps everybody. If you do outsourcing outside the United States, is that good? Yes. Is it bad? Yes. Depends on who you talk to. For the company, was that a good business decision for the company? Yes. Yes. 
They're making a greater profit, and remember, no profit, belly up. Was that a good business decision for the city of Shreveport? No. Was that a good business city for those 950 folks? No. So outsourcing, it's all a balance. It's all a balance. When you outsource outside the United States, it's all a balance. See, it's good, it's bad, it kind of depends. All right, so that's the idea. Um, our government is trying to bring some of these outsourced jobs back home. They're trying to get people to, businesses to produce more and more stuff in America. And look, here's the problem. The CEO of ABC Manufacturing says, hey look, I'd love to produce in America. But if I bring it back to America, it's going to cut my profits. As a matter of fact, it may be so that I don't make a profit and my company goes belly up. So here's a question. Would you rather lose a thousand jobs or would you rather lose 1,300 jobs? Hmm. Well, that's my only choice. So the idea is companies will say, sure, I'll come back. I'll be glad to come back and produce in America. But you've got to make it worth my while. You've got to make it where I can be profitable. And that's why a lot of times government, especially federal government, is trying to help give incentives and things and make it, and make it profitable for businesses to come back and produce in the United States. Because do you want products bought in the United States? So do I. Do you ever pay any attention to where products are bought? I do. I'm not going to buy an American flag made in China. It just ain't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. I buy a good number of American flags. We use them in our run for the red, white, and blue out at Chenault Museum. I have a very long driveway, about a 500-foot driveway to my house. Uh, I line my driveway by, with 12 by 18 American flags on Veterans Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and that sort of thing. And I change out those flags on occasion. Where are those flags made? In the United States, because I make sure. Sorry, mini tangent there. But you kind of get the idea behind the outsourcing. Now, first of all, most people don't understand it. They don't understand what outsourcing is. If a person does understand it, they're going to take a position, it's good or it's bad. But see, now you know the whole picture. You know why businesses do it. You know why it's good. You know why it's bad. You understand what outsourcing is, and you understand there's a balance. Okay, one more. Remember, all the businesses will know everything else we've talked about is to be familiar with. As you can probably understand, because this is the foundation chapter. Chapter one, chapter two, they're the, they're the biggie chapters. All right. Let's go to stakeholders. Stakeholders. Stakeholders are people that have stakes and go around and kill vampires or werewolves. Isn't there some, one of those, one of them gets killed with a silver bullet and one gets killed with a stake to the heart. I never can remember which is which. But that's not exactly what a stakeholder is. A stakeholder is anyone, did I put it in our handout? A stakeholder, all I said, who are stakeholders? All the people that gain or lose or are affected by business. Stakeholders are all the people that are have a stake in a business or affected by the operation of a business. So I'd ask you, who are, who are stakeholders? You say, well, the employees. Of course, you are absolutely right. Employees of a business are certainly stakeholders. Who else? Who else might be stakeholders in a business? Yep, the owners may be. No, they won't maybe, they are huge stakeholders in a business. All right. But let's think for a minute. Uh, I, if you don't if you don't have this down by now, uh, you probably aren't going to put it down. You've already got it, got it figured out, you've got it in your notes. So let's talk a little bit about stakeholders. How are you doing so far? Interesting stuff, isn't it? Isn't it interesting? You understand why a lot of people just don't understand this? 
I mean, I mean, I'm not, and I'm, I'm seriously, I mean, to be honest and very serious, I'm not talking, saying that people are not smart. Just saying they don't have the opportunity to understand what business is all about. Already, you just, you're just, your head's just bursting with understanding of business. <clears throat> you know what a business is. You know what profit is. You know what outsourcing is. Goods and services, entrepreneur risk laws. Those are things most people just don't have a total grasp of. Now, here's a biggie also, stakeholders. All the people that are affected by business. You said that stakeholders are uh, uh, employees. And owners. You're absolutely right. So let's do this. We got a new business coming to Monroe, Louisiana, West Monroe, Louisiana, uh, July the 1st. 1 July 2020. They're going to hire 2,000 employees. Wow. This is going to be a huge business, isn't it? I'm making this huge to make a point. 500 of these employees are going to come from outside this area. 1,500 are going to be hired locally. The average wage or the average salary for these people is going to be uh, $54,000 a year. Are you ready for a job? Because I can tell you, $54,000 a year salary or wage in Monroe, West Monroe, Louisiana, Northeast Louisiana, pretty good salary. Okay. So you've got the premise here. Here's where we are. So my question is again, who are the stakeholders? Who are the stakeholders? Well, you said the employees. Hey, 2,000 employees, are they going to be affected when this business opens on 1 July? Of course. You've already told me that. The owners? Somebody owns this business. Boy, they probably have some risk involved. Are they going to be affected by this business? Absolutely. Anybody else? Hmm? Any others that's going to be affected? Well, let's start looking. If 500 people are coming from the outside, outside of Northeast Louisiana, who's going to be affected? What about the real estate industry? Are these people going to be buying homes? Renting homes? Yeah. So the real estate industry in this area is going to really be, are they going to be affected positively or negatively? Positively. A lot of sales. A lot of sales. Um, these 1,500 people here that are being hired locally, $54,000 a year, they probably really like where they live. Some of them may decide, though, to buy a new home. So that's going to be the same thing here. What might you do to your home if you decide not to, uh, you want to keep it? Maybe you want to remodel it, add a room, do some things to your home. Hey, is that going to affect maybe Lowe's, Home Depot? Is that going to affect electricians, carpenters, plumbers, contractors? Yeah. Hey, I know one thing. If I get my new job at $54,000 a year, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go out and buy me a, a new car or maybe a used car. No, wait a minute, nobody buys a used car. You buy a pre-owned car, right? I'm going to buy me a new car or a pre-owned car. Get me something new. Okay. What's that going to do to the new car sales? Pre-owned car sales. Wow. Uh, are you going to pay cash for that car? No. You're going to well, do what? You're going to get a loan. Where? In a bank or a credit union. Wow, is that going to help the bank? Is that going to help the credit union? Yeah. Hey, I'm making $54,000 a year now. Uh, I'm going to make sure I go out at least a couple, two or three nights a week and eat. Eat out. Hey, everybody eats out already, it seems like. Is that going to help the restaurants? Hey, I'm going to buy some more clothes, shoes. What's that going to do to the mall? Walmart. Targets. How about government? This new business is probably going to be paying what? 
taxes. And all those people that have this job, what are they going to be paying? Taxes, especially sales taxes. What do sales taxes do? That helps local government. <coughs> so government's going to be helped. The restaurant industry is going to be helped. Uh, the realty and real estate industry is going to be helped. The new and used car industry is going to be helped. Uh, the financial industry is going to be helped. I, I may have already said it, malls, the retail stores are going to be helped. And I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving out, uh, uh, this business may do a good bit of advertising. The media is going to be helped. It seems to me that if this business comes into Monroe, it affects a lot of folks. Who are the stakeholders? There's a ton of stakeholders. You know, the employees and the owners, but think about, and I've, I'm sure I've left out others, think about, you can almost say, I'm not sure who wouldn't, wouldn't be affected. Are schools going to be affected? Well, that's a part of government, yes. And new additional, additional students, which means additional rooms, but also uh, uh, space, but it also means additional revenue from the state. Uh, just every, it seems like in most everybody's going to be affected positively. Now, I don't know what this company does, but if this company does something that other businesses in Monroe do, those other businesses may be affected negatively because they may lose some employees or this company may take some of their business. So there could be that negative impact. But for the most part, the overwhelming impact is positive. Now, what if this company, well, let us do this. Here's another biggie. People do not understand. Businesses create what? Businesses create opportunity. Businesses create jobs. But the word I like to use, and I used here in chapter one, businesses create wealth. You get it? Make sense? Got to make sense to you. Our Northeast Louisiana, Washita Parish area would be richer by the, this new business coming in. We would have more wealth in the community virtually everybody benefits. Is that important? It's huge. If you go up to the normal person, the average person, and you say, hey, you know businesses create wealth? What are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. You do, though. You understand what that means. That's a big, big deal. In chapter two, we talk about economics. Economics, we really get to talking about wealth and how important wealth is. Now, let's say that this business did not hire 2,000 people. Let's say this business hired only four people. Is it still important? Yeah. Is it still going to create some wealth? Yes. So here's the deal. It doesn't have to be a huge business. It can be a small business. But successful businesses are creating wealth. So what do communities want? They want to bring in businesses. And that's why communities and, and cities and towns and parishes are always courting businesses to come in because it creates wealth. And once you be, get those businesses, you want to retain those businesses. Because when you lose those businesses, your wealth goes down. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention something here just to, to a contrast. This is so scary, I, I don't even want it to, to, to even think about it. But let's say that this weekend, CenturyLink went away. That's, that's too terrible to think about. Let's just pretend. Monday morning, the place was deserted. Nobody was there. What would that do to our wealth in this community? What would it do to the real estate industry? The financial industry? the mall, retail, restaurants, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, low, you, you got the idea. Just the opposite of what happened here would be the case if a business left. That's why you don't need to, you want to attract new businesses, you want to keep new businesses once you get them. It's very, very important. It's very important to do that. 
So that's kind of the idea behind behind stakeholders. You know, we all have a pretty big stake. Now, this is just, there's two other quick things, believe it or not, and I am done with chapter one. Chapter one, chapter one and chapter two, though, are huge chapters. Uh, obviously, stakeholders, not one of those things, you, all this stuff you need to be familiar with. Businesses create wealth. Be familiar with that. For businesses to create wealth, they have to have what's called the five factors of production. I want you to know these. In other words, let's say there's a person getting ready to start a new business and they're in an airplane and they're flying over. And they got big binoculars and they're flying over and, and they're looking for, for a place to, to have their new business. But here's what they're looking for. They're looking for the five factors of production. Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, Wow, I think I spelled it. And knowledge. So what are you talking about? For me to have a business and locate my business somewhere, does it have to be a land available? Yeah, what kind of land? Good land. Uh, land that has utilities on it or running to it. Graphic Packaging just built a big, humongous new building right past us here uh, as on the, the, uh, the next exit. And if you've ever gone, if you ever looked out close to Washington High School, if you hadn't, ever hadn't been out there, you, you should drive, go out, drive by and look at it. Why was that a good location for them? It's a good location for them because there were utilities. There was gas and electricity and everything already out there. There was a major interstate highway within a half a mile. There's a regional airport. It was land, but it was good land. It was land that was good for the purpose that they were going to do. Now, if you're going to open up a humongous duck hunting uh, 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 business with uh, a lodge and all this kind of stuff, you'd want swamp land. But graphic packaging, perfect location. Sometimes do, do, do communities prepare land that has all the necessary utilities and stuff so it makes it attractive to businesses? Sure. So you know what land is? Labor. There's got to be available labor. The labor either has to be knowledgeable of what the company's doing, or the labor has to be able to be trained. Washington, uh, Delta Community College trains a lot of people. We train people for graphic packaging. We train, train people for Angus. We do a lot of training for companies. You've got to have, you've got to have knowledgeable labor or, or available labor and labor that, that can be trained. Capital, that's just the buildings and equipment and stuff that can be available to you. Entrepreneurship, we know what that is. That's that entrepreneurial spirit. That's, that, that's the having someone that will take the risk to go out and do something. And you've got to have knowledge. You've got to, you've got to have the know-how. You've, you've got to have the entrepreneurial spirit. You've got to be able to accept the possibilities of, of certain risk and step out. But you've got to do it from a knowledgeable viewpoint. Those are the five factors of production. Those are what businesses have to have. I would know the five factors of production. I would know the definition of business. And I would be familiar with these other things we've talked about, all of them. One more time, what I mean by be familiar with? Uh, <clears throat> true false. Expenses minus revenue equals profit. False. Um, I could do a, I could do a, a matching. I could put risk on one side, and I could put uh, on the other side. Uh, um, uh, time and money. That kind of a match. That's what I would do with those kind of things. Last area that we want to talk about. Actually, if you've got your handout, which I do, if I can find it, that's this side of the handout. The back side. Oh my gosh, we still got the whole back side of the handout. We do, but I do this fast. What affects you every day? 
You don't live in a cave. You live right in the middle of stuff. What affects you? Do your other family members affect you? Uh, does the weather affect you? Could government affect you? Uh, could friends affect you? Could the traffic affect you? In other words, there's, you're, you're in the middle of a lot of stuff. You know, sometimes it's kind of like, I just like to do what I want to do and just be left alone. You know that's not going to happen. Well, business is the same way. Business is, they are within an environment. They live within an environment just like we live within an environment. And I forgot to put one up here. Let's get this one. <clears throat> Does the economy affect businesses? Woo, well, we know that right now, don't we? So there are the eco economics, the economy, and that's chapter two, affects business. Do legal stuff affect business? Yes. The fact that business now is not just regional, it's global. We are in a world of global business. Your biggest competitor may be somebody in, or your biggest customer may be somebody in Hong Kong. Your biggest competitor may not be somebody next door, it may be somebody in Australia. We're global. Does that affect business? Now, I'm not saying it affects it good or it affects it bad. It could be either one. But businesses live in a, in a very changing, dynamic environment. Uh, does technology affect business? Woo, can you say Blockbusters? Do you even know what Blockbusters is? If you don't, look it up. Google it. Blockbusters was the top of the mountain. And they got fat and lazy and successful, and they fell off the mountain to Redbox. Okay. Competition. Most businesses have competition. Does your competition affect? Yeah. Social. People. Customers. The, the people, does our, within our country, we have a certain culture. Is our culture changing over time? Yes. Pretty quickly? Yes. Let me talk a little bit about, a couple of things about culture. About the social environment. There's a word called, and I'll, I'll put it over here, demography. I'd be familiar with this. Demography is the study of people, the human population. Uh, Right-handed, left-handed, men, women, race, blue-eyed, brown-eyed, male, female, ethnicity. It's just a study of the human population. Is the human population changing? Yeah. Uh, are we becoming more diverse as a nation? Yes. Is this changing culture and diversity, does this have an effect on business? Absolutely. I'd be familiar with the fact, I'd be familiar with what demography is, the study of the human population, such as race and income and that sort of thing, and I'd be familiar with the fact that, that uh, we're becoming more diverse as a nation. Whew, whew, I'm wore out. I'm worn out. That's chapter one. I, I started doing this on, is it still Friday? I hope I didn't go into Saturday. It seems like I've been a long time on this video. By the way, all videos are not as long as chapter one and chapter two. There will be some videos that will be five minutes, huh. ten minutes. So if you say, if all the videos are this long, I'll never make it. Relax. Two is going to be a fairly lengthy video. But after that, they become normal, and some of them even small or, or, or shorter. So I appreciate you being with me. Are you smarter? Are you smarter? Do you know more stuff? You have already have a better understanding of what business is. Do you understand why I say that you now know more about it than a lot, a lot of people do? And you know kind of how it all fits together? And you kind of know, understand this thing about a balance? And what businesses are and what they're trying to do? Okay. All right. That takes care, I think, of chapter one. Uh, I have to do the loud hand clap if you watched uh, the introductory video. That's the way that my executive producer, Ryan Pierce, realizes that I am done with the chapter. So I'm going to do a loud hand clap. That will end chapter one. And I'll see you in chapter two.